let's go through some of these structures uh, a little bit more carefully and look at some of the features that they have and again some of the pros and cons. And let's start with the traditional Western church as we saw. This would be the one that was on the far right side of the diagram. And this church is based upon essentially the Christendom model. Like I said, there was sort of the assumption that if you were born in a certain place that you were just sort of born into the church. Everyone was more or less a Christian. People were baptized into the church and uh, confirmed into the church and buried by the church, married by the church. And uh, it was based on that sort of a model. And it was also uh, usually in the uh, uh, a clergy center sort of centered sort of ministry where there was a pastor who was responsibility was to oversee all the ministry. He did most of the important ministry, whether it's preaching or marrying and uh, baptizing or counseling. All the different ministries are pretty much around this person who was professionally trained for all these ministries. Uh, the lay person would attend and, and carry on other lesser important ministries, but uh, the really important things were done by the clergy. As I mentioned, it's a parish system where very often this would be in the village life. Where's the church? The church is right in the center of the village and everybody can walk to the church. Everybody walks home after church. In the village, everybody kind of knows everyone. And so you have an infrastructure in the village life. Uh, everybody pretty much knows how everybody's doing. Um, and you often have your relatives are still nearby, your extended family, the aunts and uncles. Um, they have the farm next to your farm. And so you had a support system. The social, the societal system was such that there was a lot of care. There was not much anonymity. And the, and the village was pretty much centered around the very, the center of that village where people would come and do their shopping and take care of their day-to-day uh, -day needs and then go back to their, their farms or uh, their little small industries. And so it's very fairly well suited to that type of small village life where people are uh, in that kind of socially integrated system. Of course, in big cities, you lose that. People live in these high-rise buildings where there's 100 people who live in that building and uh, you hardly know anybody. You see somebody in the elevator every morning and that's about it. And so you live like anonymous in the big city. And so some of the values of why that parish system worked begin to break down. Buildings are important because of the centralized life of the church and that church building is a visible marker that the church is an integrating point. As I mentioned, and very often traditionally, that church is right in the town square, right there in the middle of, of town. And in the Christendom model, every time anything important happens, well, the local priest or the local pastor is there praying or, or doing some ritual to give a blessing to public events. You have centralized governance of the church. And otherwise, <clears throat> in other words, the church has a central board that makes all the major decisions of uh, how the life of the church is going to go. And it's very program oriented. And so the church is based upon programs which for the most part take place in that building. And uh, so you have your Sunday morning worship, that's sort of like a program. You have a choir and you know the music people, well they have kind of their program and then you may have a youth group program. Very often the programs become structured by age um, and um, or a program for uh, people in the community who have special needs. And so it tends to grow by adding staff. In other words, if you want to grow, you grow programs. So we want to now have an outreach to senior citizens or we now want to have an outreach to young people. And so Typically, a smaller church will hire additional staff because these programs, we want them to be run well by people who know how to do this. And so we may hire a youth pastor. We may hire a counselor or a visitation pastor who's really good at just doing that. And so as a church grows, it tends to, to hire in more staff who are paid to do ministry and to do it very well. So that's the way the traditional Western church tends to work. And the bigger the church gets, the more staff. 
I attend a church that has about 2,000 people on a weekend attendance, and we have at least a dozen pastoral staff, and the pastoral staff have different responsibilities, and that gets divided up, plus then there's other secretarial help and other infrastructure. It's very much large churches like this tend to have a lot of staffing to run the programs. Typically, the goal of the pastoral staff is really to shepherd the believers. The primary focus is keeping the sheep, this is kind of a negative way to put it, but to keep the sheep in the pen happy and healthy. In other words, the primary job of the pastors is to do the counseling, the teaching, the caregiving, the visiting, and um, to make sure that those sheep are well brushed, they're well fed, they're not, they're not complaining too much, they don't get into trouble, they don't go running off, get that sheep back in, we don't want sheep running off. And so we take care of the sheep that are already part of our flock, right? It's not that missionally oriented that my, my primary focus is reaching new people who are outside the flock. See, in the Christendom model, everybody who lived in town was part of the flock. There weren't very many people outside the flock. They were just all part of the village church, right? But you see, as soon as you get a diverse society where it's pluralistic and you've got other people who are not Christians, you live in a big city where a lot of people just don't attend church. You may have immigrant groups that are coming and they're from a different religious background. There's no missional outreach there to say, how will we reach new people who don't know Jesus? How will we preach the gospel? How will we welcome new people? You see, as long as you have a village, everybody knows the village life. Everybody feels comfortable with village life. Everybody's pretty much the same. We understand each other. But the more diverse your society becomes, the more difficult it is to be effective that way. And so it tends to be a shepherding-oriented sort of ministry. And so evangelism then becomes a department. Oh, well, we'll hire a staff member who's responsible for evangelism. They're really good at that, and they'll train some people to do that. And so evangelism, outreach, community ministry, that becomes sort of an extra thing that the church also does, but the primary focus tends to be, tends to be pretty much caring for the people already in the church. And so as you can see, that it can be very effective at doing that, but this type of church is always having to, to push itself to move outside of itself to reach new people and to welcome new people in. Uh, that can be a challenge for this type of church. Now, some churches are very outreach oriented that have this traditional structure, but quite frankly, it's more unusual. So evangelism for this type of church is what we often call attractional evangelism. In other words, the church has a program that you invite unbelievers to attend. So that program may be, say, a concert, a Christian concert. And typically it will happen in the church building. And so the job of the congregation is to go and invite your non-Christian friends to attend this event. And they'll go to this Christian concert and um, they may hear the gospel there. Maybe they'll hear the gospel for the first time. Or maybe that event is uh, um, some sort of evangelistic speaker that speaks on a special topic. And so you invite your people, your non-Christian friends to come hear this topic, they hear the topic, and then maybe there's some sort of a call to make a commitment to Christ, to, uh, to uh, pray to receive Jesus. And so that's how they hear the gospel. And in some settings, this works very well. Um, people are glad to be invited to an event like this, and they come. But in other settings, that's not so much the case. Um, so you hand out a lot of invitations, you maybe advertise in the newspaper, nobody comes. <laughs> well, that's a problem if you're in that sort of setting. Now, if you're in a setting where you do the, you invite people and people are coming and hearing the gospel, praise God, wonderful thing. But this type of church tends to be doing this. And they might have other attractional programs. So you might have a, uh, um, a program for, for women and um, you invite your non-Christian friends to come to this, uh, a women's breakfast or something, or there might be a men's event. And so we'll invite the star football player who happens to be a Christian and we'll have him come and he's gonna speak 
And I'll invite all of my non-Christian friends who love football. They don't love the church. They don't like Jesus, but they like football. And they'll come and hear this football player, and he'll tell his story about how he came to know Christ, and, and they hear the gospel. So that's the way these tr traditional churches tend to operate. Some of them will train people to do more personal type of evangelism also, but they tend to be program-oriented. We call this sort of an elephant-type church. Um, the elephant-type church, because it's big, it's strong, it's uh, solid. So uh, the elephant church is usually a larger church. Uh, by large, that may be 100 people, uh, maybe 1,000 or several thousand. It's intelligent. It's got professional expertise. Its leaders have been trained in the Bible and theology and how to do ministry. It's high visibility. Elephants don't hide very well. You know, they, uh, you, you see an elephant. If it's in the field, you can see it. And a large church has, it's an advantage to a large church. You've got this, this big building in, in the town and people see it and they hear about it. Uh, a lot of people tend that church. So a lot of people know somebody maybe in that church. It's not a bad thing to have high visibility. Now, it can be a bad thing if persecution breaks out because the government or those, maybe it's not the government, maybe it's another radical religious group. They can see the church. And so we sometimes hear of this where the churches uh, are being burnt down. There's a radical religious group that attacks a church building. They burn down the building. Um, well, what happens when the building's burnt down? Where do you meet? Where do you do your programs? Or what happens if they arrest the pastor and the pastor's now in jail? Now who's going to care for the flock? You see, because we didn't train other people how to care for the flock. It was the pastor who cared for the flock. And so now the pastor's in jail. Who cares for the flock? Burn down the church building, no place to meet. Arrest the pastor, nobody to care for the sheep. Life of the church is in, in a crisis. And so the high visibility can be a negative if you're in a vulnerable society. Elephants are long-lived. You know, an elephant has a life expectancy of 60 to 80 years. And, you know, established churches like this, they, they often have a long life expectancy. They, they're pretty stable in that regard. They, they, once a church has reached a certain established level, you know, they have their building and their programs and so on, they usually uh, will last pretty long. They're not that vulnerable. Problem with elephants, very slow to multiply. They reproduce slowly. See, it's hard to reproduce those programs. It's hard to get another building. You know, it costs thousands and thousands of dollars or rubles or, or euros to build that building. You can only build so many of those. They're hard to reproduce. It's hard to train a person to be that kind of a professional pastor. And so they are very slow to multiply. It takes years to build up a church to have that kind of a solid ministry with all those advantages. Let's talk about rabbit type churches. I'm going to have our zoo of churches here. Let's talk about rabbit churches. Now, they don't look like much compared to an elephant. Rabbit churches, they're small. Rabbit churches are like house churches. Everybody knows each other. There's only a dozen people, 20 people maybe. Very relational. See, it's not so much about the programs. In fact, they don't have programs, because if you only got 20 people, how many programs can you have? Not much. So it's all about relationship, people meeting together, reading the Bible together, sharing life together. Very, very simple, basic, minimal ministry. Of course, we sort of see that in the New Testament, don't we? We don't, don't see a lot of programs. We don't see a lot of buildings. They're just very simple ministry in the New Testament. And, of course, they're lay-led. You can't have a paid pastor if you've, if you've just got a little group with uh, a dozen or two people in it. They meet in homes or they meet in public places. Well, because you've got a small group, you usually can't afford to have a big building. And uh, so they often meet their house churches, they meet in homes. Uh, they might rent a public space. I know of one group that was uh, meeting in a bar. Um, <laughs> that's a long story about how that one developed. But uh, they may have a community center that they just rent for a couple of hours in the evening or uh, on a Sunday and they meet there. Um, so they don't have a lot of expenses, um, so they're not dependent on budgets. If you don't have to pay a pastor and you don't have to pay for buildings, um, you don't need a lot of money. 
So they have budgets, or what they do have, can, a lot of that money can go for helping the poor, can go for mission projects, can go to help other things. And they're low visibility. So we said the Elephant Church, that's high visibility. They've got their building, they've got their programs, everybody can see it. Uh, these house church type, rabbit style churches, they're low visibility. You know, to kill an elephant, you just need an elephant gun. Big gun, boom, you shoot that elephant, got it. How do you kill an army of rabbits? They're a little harder, aren't they? Because they scatter and they go into their rabbit holes, don't they? Uh, there's no elephant holes where the elephants run off and hide in their little elephant holes, is there? But rabbits, they just spread out. They go into their rabbit holes and they're hard to find. And so when persecution breaks out, uh, the rabbits scatter and the little house churches, they just meet at homes. When I was in Vietnam, I was with some house church people and um, through sort of a long circumstance of events, there was a little house church. There weren't very many people, maybe, maybe a dozen people meeting and uh, uh, government found out about it. The police came by and said, hey, this meeting is not allowed. It's against the law. It's not registered. You can't meet anymore. They said, fine. They stopped meeting met in somebody else's house. And they just started over again somewhere else. And it uh, took a while for the government to figure out whether they were meeting in someplace else. And so um, these rabbit-style churches are, are what we would call persecution-proof because they're so small. Um, now, they are more vulnerable. Rabbits don't live very long. Your average rabbit, maybe eight years, not the 80 years of an elephant. And uh, so we know that a lot of these house church type movements, sometimes they don't last very long. Um, the house church may dissolve. Uh, all it takes is a little conflict in a little house church and people go their way. See, in a big church, if you have a conflict, you know, you've got a lot of people. If one family leaves, well, you know, that was sad, but the church goes on, you've got stability. I compare it to like a big ship. A big ship does not capsize easy, right? Capsize means that it turns over and sinks, right? A little rowboat, all it takes is a couple people shaking that rowboat and it can capsize. And so these little, little rabbit-sized churches, if you have a conflict, if you have somebody who's creating trouble in the group, well, it can easily dissolve and, and, and die. The larger churches are more stable. But Rabbits are quick to multiply. Rabbits are famous for multiplication, right? And, um, well, let's just talk about this a little bit more. How about a pair of elephants? You've got a pair of elephants. Um, how well do they reproduce? Well, they're fertile four times a year. You have four chances in a year to have a pregnancy. And they only have one baby, one child, per pregnancy. So you have then have a 22-month gestation period. So from the time of conception until that baby elephant is delivered, it's 22 months. That's almost two years. So what this means is, oh, and by the way, an elephant doesn't become sexually mature to be able to reproduce until they're at least nine years old. So what this means is in three years, how many elephants do you get? Baby elephants? The elephant family grows from two to three. So they don't reproduce very quickly, do they? Dare I say how rabbits reproduce? Well, rabbits, they're continuously fertile. <laughs> rabbits, they have an average of seven babies per pregnancy. They only have one month gestation period. So from the time that rabbit conceives till it delivers their seven babies, one month. And they become sexually mature at four months. So in three years, two rabbits can become theoretically, anybody want to guess? 476 million rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> Now, obviously, not every rabbit reproduces that much, and uh, not every baby rabbit lives, and so on and so forth. But you kind of get the point. The point being that the traditional church reproduces very slowly because it requires so many resources, programs, 
leadership. The house church, on the other hand, has the potential, the potential at least, to reproduce rapidly because it's not dependent on big budgets, it's not dependent on buildings, and it's not dependent on professional trained clergy. Um, and so it's really, it's really dependent on is people sharing their faith and then integrating these people into the groups. And as that group becomes larger, it then divides and reproduces. It becomes two groups and so on, just like cell division, cell reproduction. And so the idea is that if we want more rapid church reproduction, we need maybe not house churches, but we need more flexible ways of reproducing ministry that aren't dependent on buildings, budgets, and what we call big shots, the big pastor who's that big, strong leader. Now, some people will say, well, the house church type of system, it really doesn't work where we're at. Say in China and places like that, it's worked, and, or in India, uh, certain places, uh, especially where there's persecution, these kind of small house church movements flourish and thrive where, where God is at work. But in other places, we say, you know, that doesn't work very well. Um, we need more respectability. That's viewed as a sect or some sort of a weird thing in our society. Uh, people would not feel comfortable going into somebody's home. Um, and so many times people say the house church is really not a very good option for our context. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. So I began to think about this. What if we took the best of both? Could we mate an elephant with a rabbit? Um, that's kind of a scary thought. Um, could we have the best of both? That kind of small, versatile, rabbit-style church, but the stability and the, the professionalism of the, the elephant-style church, would that, would that work? Um, and uh, I think it can, and that's, that's what we call, we'll see with God, all things are possible, right? So we call this the Rabifant Church. It's the hybrid of the elephant and the rabbit, the Rabifant Church. Um, so they are the best of both animals. And they're also called cell churches or networked house churches. And now, if you can imagine this, I actually have a picture of a Rabifant. You didn't think these existed, did you? Um, but there, there is such a thing as a rabifant, and I have a picture of one right there. Um, and uh, the rabifant is this hybrid. And so it's going to bring together the best of both. And um, you think I'm making fun here. I'm not making fun. This is, this is serious business, what I'm, I'm talking about here. And this is basically the cell celebration model that says the celebration takes all those advantages of the elephant-type church. The cell has all the advantages of the rabbit-style church. And so if persecution breaks out and they shut down the big celebration and there's no longer the professional leaders, those cells become like the rabbits that go into their holes. They continue to have church life. And yet, You've got the advantages of good leadership and strong leadership. So um, the basic two structures, traditional Western church and house church, to that we add then the cell church or the house church network. And so it's the cell celebration idea or the networked house churches that are working together collaboratively. They may not have that central celebration, but they're very well networked working together. And so radical cell churches, and I'm using the word radical because we're not just talking about a traditional church with a few small groups. That's a mistake. Some churches will say, well, we tried small groups and that didn't really work. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about radically decentralizing the life of the church into those cell groups. So they're going to have large celebrations, 
that meet quarterly, monthly, weekly. Maybe they don't meet every single Sunday. Like I said, maybe they, they rent a hall once a month to have their large meeting. They experience being the people of God. One of the problems with the little small house church is that sometimes you feel sort of isolated. We're just a little group of people. And, but when you come together with the others, there's a sense of people of Godness. We worship together, and that's inspiring. There's a focus there in the larger celebrations on worship, on equipping. You have people who are, are skilled at equipping others. So those cell group leaders, this is one of the keys to effective cell group ministry, is that you're giving regular training uh, and equipping to those lay leaders that lead those cell groups. If you don't have that equipping, then those cell groups, they can have bad teaching, bad care, personality problems. So you have to have a, a system of training those cell group leaders. And in the larger group, you can have specialized ministry. So you may have youth ministry, that one little house church is not going to have a youth ministry, or a ministry to, say, single mothers or, or people like that, where a, a little house church couldn't really minister very well. And you would reproduce those celebrations as needed. You don't have to do that every year or maybe even every five years. The reproduction is primarily in the cell group level. And then you only really reproduce the celebrations as you need more space and, and, or you move into new regions. But in those small cell groups, they would be meeting weekly or maybe even more often. That's where you experience not this people of God, you experience family of God. Every individual is important. You're a small group. The focus in the small group is not on this celebrative worship and inspiration and strong preaching and teaching. There the focus is on evangelism. You're inviting friends into this group. Or discipleship, really solid Bible study where you're helping others in obedience and, and nurturing the spiritual care where you're really caring for one another like a family would. And these groups can reproduce constantly. As God adds new people, all you have to do is make sure you're training new leaders to lead the new group. So you need an apprentice system to train new leaders so as that group grows, it can then multiply and then you have two groups. So this is the idea behind the cell celebration cell church. Now, as I mentioned in some places, that uh, rabbit style, small house church, versatile is going to be the best. And so this is why I believe it's thir uh, thrived in, in places like China or Southeast Asia. But in other places, that traditional model is going to work well, especially in smaller areas where you have village life and, and people are well integrated in the larger social system and that church plays a central role in the community. But I believe especially in urban areas where that parish system is broken down. But on the other hand, people do have certain expectations of ministry that is more stable and more professional, I believe this cell celebration model for many places is really the way to go. But it has to be done well. It has to be done consistently. And the emphasis really has to shift into equipping those cell group leaders. This is what we did in the North Munich Church. We had a, a very, very positive experience with this model. 